Hi, I'm Albert Boquette from Perfinal Core Banking, and this is clip six in my series of Core Banking Essential FAQs. Today's frequently asked question is, what problems did Core Banking not solve? First, let's go back to the reason for being for Core Banking platforms, to network and automate. How successfully do CBPs serve those purposes in 2022? Back in the 60s, 70s and 80s, when these core banking platforms were designed and introduced, they were revolutionary, but they were far from comprehensive in terms of how much they networked and automated. For a start, the networking technology of the time was slow, even for the requirements of the time. Each branch had its own on-premise, powerful, centralized mainframe to handle the high transactional throughput and multiple client sessions. These powerful mainframe core banking systems ensured reliability, but they were inherently inflexible as they needed to be scaled in advance to the expected load. While branch networking allowed customers to access their money at any branch, not just their local branch, the new system didn't change end-of-day accounting, which continued as it had done since the dawn of banking and still, in fact, continues today. End-of-day accounting means transactions are booked but not fulfilled until the end of the business day. And if those transactions miss that accounting, they are deferred until the next working day, which could be three or four days if we're talking about a holiday weekend. So it's automated to an extent, but not truly real time. These early core banking platforms were very good at providing computational heavy lifting at the back end, and the customer at the front end did experience some innovative supported automation in the form of ATMs and telephone banking, and then of course, the more recent advent of internet banking and mobile banking, all of which have been transformative. But right from the beginning, core banking platforms did not automate the full science and practice of core banking, which had always comprised financial, legal, and business fields. And whatever parts of the science and practice were left out had to be completed manually. Just like manual workers are still required to do the fiddly tasks in factories that robots can't, or manual workers are required to move the product from one automated line to the next automated line, or manual workers are required for quality control reasons. So it is with banking. Even within the financial field alone, the first core banking platforms left many processes requiring manual completion. End of day accounting and reconciliation are notable examples of very labor intensive and manual error prone activities that are still very much a feature of banking today. Even if it is typically hidden behind shiny user interfaces and seemingly real time operations. The core banking platforms were similarly unable to automate the legal requirements around, for example, anti-money laundering, anti-fraud, compliance, internal investigations and reporting. They were unable to automate in the business logic of the bank itself, that is, how a specific financial institution chooses to run its business, its models, its procedures, its organization, its profile, its MO, its semantics. Accounting, security, compliance, company procedure are all fundamental and highly problematic when not included within the automated system. But there is one other aspect of core banking that really became especially problematic over time, and that is adaptiveness. Adaptiveness to an ever-changing environment and adaptiveness to new products the bank will periodically want to introduce. And this really became apparent with the rise of internet and mobile banking in the 2000s and the proliferation of new services, with customers increasingly expecting those services to be accessible at the touch of a button 24-7 
with 70% of UK customers almost overnight saying they almost never visited a branch anymore and rarely even used cash. Now, remember, the mainframe core banking introduced from the 60s to the 90s that most big banks continue to use today is reliable, but not flexible, and certainly not real-time because these mainframe systems don't automate significant parts of core banking processes and they are designed for end-of-day accounting. And they must be scaled in advance to the predicted load and so on. They are monolithic in design, meaning that everything is one app. And if any change is applied anywhere within that one app, the whole thing needs to be redeployed and debugged with all kinds of chaos theory type side effects. Banks don't like that. So from the 2000s, there's this huge gulf between customer expectation and the technological limitation imposed by these systems that haven't fundamentally changed since the 1980s. So what the banks and their tech providers did was to create several clever workarounds. The first was to bolt on the newly required functionality to alternative systems, allowing banks to maintain their reliable, established mainframe systems while simultaneously offering modern propositions. It's a bit like plugging your iPhone into an old hi-fi system so you can play your Spotify playlist on your granddad's stereo. The second class of workarounds involved deploying new software directly into the old mainframe in order to expose data via APIs. APIs really became the technical buzzword in core banking following the wave of open banking legislation from 2015 to 2018, because APIs are the primary means by which third-party providers, also known as fintechs, plug into the core banking of banks. And here you get the link between core banking tech, open banking legislation, and the fintech buzz. The third workaround was for end-of-day batch processing and accounting, so that banks could continue to process transactions offline after the end of day while simultaneously running their end-of-day batch processes and accounting. For banks, these workarounds allowed them to keep their mainframe systems while supplying customers with their seemingly 24-7 real-time online mobile banking services. But what these workarounds also did was to trade front-end quick fixes for more back-end complexity and increased points of failure while kicking the underlying problems ever further down the road. Specifically, these workarounds created more need for manual reconciliations, more complex accounting requirements, and issues with data silos, data dispersal, and data duplication, especially around customer management. Now you had different parts of the customer chopped up Frankenstein's monster style with some parts cloned here and some parts missing there. This data swamp monster in turn demanded further workarounds. The failure to address the underlying technical issues, meanwhile, meant that quick fixes, after initially delivering a kind of boost, soon found that technical debt coming back with even more of a vengeance, compounded by the added mess of patches and workarounds referred to in the industry as spaghetti systems. So, to summarize this rather lengthy installment, the first core banking platforms were able to network branches and automate to an extent the computational parts of the transactions, but they were still tied to end-of-day accounting. They were never designed to be real-time, and they were never able to automate the full range of multidisciplinary processes involved in dealing with other people's money. In some ways, they never attempted to create the, the analytics required uh, to factor in the, uh, the full multidisciplinary requirements. They achieved a lot for their time, but it was a slower time. And that allowed time to fill in the significant gaps in what the system covered. Workarounds kind of worked for a time, but at the cost of back-end complexity and increasing risk of non-compliance. 
Ultimately, with related technology and market demand always moving forward and mainframes becoming increasingly outmoded, this strategy of relying on workarounds would inevitably become unsustainable.